John Sternwald. She started out in a small village outside of um, Stockholm, Sweden, which is kind of over here. In 1912, she decided, well, her parents decided, that she was going to move to New York. There was just a terrible economic situation in Stockholm, and so like, no, they had no future there. So, she got on a ship, and she went to um, Ellis Island, New York. And fortunately, her name was easy enough to spell, and she got to keep it. So, after, after moving, she moved in with some relatives in Brooklyn. And there she stayed for a couple of years until she got on her feet economically. Also, she, so she could get a husband. She married Einar Sternlaw, which is where she got her last name. He, he used to be like a cabin boy on a big ocean liner, and he had been to every nation but two. So, he, she married her, um, sorry, she married him, and they moved into a, like a separate apartment in Brooklyn. And after about a decade, they moved to Staten Island, which is over here. After moving there, they built a little log cabin, and they lived there for a while. Eva had a daughter named Ruth, and they actually went back to Stockholm three times during her life. One of, them, one of which was actually in the middle of World War I. They nearly got torpedoed. So yeah, Eva got to meet um, both of her grandchildren, and then she died. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> or Baptista Allison Jr. as he was known before he immigrated. I uh, lived in a small town in Cuba. He actually lived inside a castle. But not like, you know, not like a thing or whatever. He, he, um, his dad worked for the church as an accountant, so he had uh, gotten an apartment in a castle for the um, church. Um, in 1912, his father died and his brother inherited everything, so he didn't have any work to do. And he, couldn't, he had no way to make money. So he traveled to North America. So they couldn't get into the United States at first, so he went to Canada, then he moved across the border with his cousins. Uh, his cousins ended up traveling to Chicago, but he stayed in North Boston and got a job as a dishmaker with the young know, construction company. Um, time went by, he met my grandmother when he was about 16. Uh, you know, she lost the story. They were friends, they started dating, they got married. I uh, went by really quick, and then they tried, when they got married, they tried running off to New York. That did not work. They did not like New York. So uh, they went back. The family forgave them after some time and negotiations. Um, and then my uh, my uh, great grand great great grandfather, he uh, became a contractor. It's kind of kind of like a construction worker, except you get better tools and more pay. Then they had seven kids. Life went on. Um, and as a contractor, he couldn't, he couldn't really read at all. Not as a contractor, but he had like a language barrier. And so he had his wife um, go over everything and read it and translate the documents he had to sign to him. So he, she would go up with him on every job. And then one time they went to work on the LaGuardia Airport. Um, and he was working on the forklift. And he uh, died of heart attack. Oh. It's like Thomas's. Uh, John Colley was my great great grandfather. John Colley was born in the Union Street in 1887. I don't know where that is, but that's the thing. So, uh, uh, John's father was a baker. He didn't grow up wealthy, but you know, he wasn't poor either. He was able to graduate high school at age 16 and worked as an English teacher until he left England. He met a woman who wanted to marry her. She was more wealthy than him, so he knew her father to approve of marriage. They tried to get married in secret, but her father found out and her day of marriage, causing John to leave friends, family, name behind without telling him. He changed his name to John Rogers, as he was doing with those He moved to New Calum, Canada in 1905 where he built this for a few years before deciding to move to Portland, Oregon, likely due to the fact that Portland was one of the most important at the time. In Portland, he built ships and cabinets for a few years before deciding to move to Hillsborough, Oregon, where he worked in landscaping. 
It was in Hillsboro, where he met his wife, and they got married in 1970. They had three kids together, all good, until so he fell out of the car in 1963 and died. <laughs> My great, the reason I know this story has never told anyone about this story. It's because my great grandmother and her sister were interested in his past. So they traveled to Leominster, England, to find out about it. That's where they found out about the Roger Sherman. Not his actual family, but just the Roger Sherman. Who, you know, you can tell that you can guess that they figured out pretty quickly that that's not his family. But they pointed them in the direction of the colleagues who, who uh, owned the paper. Who then pointed them in the direction of the woman who had been married, who was finally talking to them until she figured out who they were, stop talking to them. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Kim Bienema, and my great grandfather, Arthur Bienema, immigrated from the Netherlands. Arthur was born. Arthur was born on June 26, 1970, and that would make him 104 if he was still alive today. He was born in the New Orleans, and he speaks Dutch, and that's what it's called. His family situation was he was the youngest of four, with three older sisters, and he was 1911. Like he was very self sufficient and very independent. He was very happy and very well behaved. He immigrated to England in 1911, so we don't know much about his childhood. Um, they are ready for a better economic situation, and they, they arrived at Ellis Island, and came through Ellis Island in 1928, and they eventually settled in Crawford Park, New Jersey, which was like, kind of like a mini, you know, it's kind of place. There's four people that were kind of immigrated. So, his family was very, very strict about religion, and they attended the Dutch Reform Church, and that was like his whole community. His whole community was based on the church they went to. When he was 15, his dad was killed at work in an accident building a trailer. He got like hit really hard in the head and he was several brain injury and killed him. And then at 15, he has to support his whole family and he goes to work in the exact same place his dad was killed at 15. Um, and neighbors, and um, there, a bit of an example of his personality was uh, one time he dropped a hot rod of steel into his shoe, and he burned a hole through his foot, and he kept working. Uh, and then another one was he dropped a massive steel plate onto his foot, and didn't even take his shoe off, and when he got home, he took his shoe off again. That's where he was held. <laughs> oh, my yeah, so God. Yes, he was very, very stoic. And, <laughs> and maybe, he, he would have been on the spectrum, but he was alive. And, like, he was alive. So, eventually, he got his engineering diploma, and he married, he was married to, he got married to a Dutch woman named Catherine Van Dyke at age 29. And he had five kids, and their oldest was my grandfather, Long Vietnam. Thank you. I can't <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, when Nora was about 11, um, her younger brother Frank died because he came home early from school um, because he was sick, and a few hours later he died. He was seven years old. His mother never really recovered from that. When she was around, when she was around her older teen years, she got a, um, a job of taking care of the doctor's kids. 
Um, St. Thomas is a poor place and is famous for glass blowing and is not a touristy place at all. Though it is um, in between Liverpool and Manchester, so sometimes it gets visitors from because they visited from Liverpool because they visited Liverpool, but um, nobody really goes there. When World War II broke out, um, things were hard, but two years before it ended, Nora was about 23, she met Richard Lyons, who was a soldier and was in England because of the war. Also, he was 15 years older than her. They ended up falling in love, but her parents didn't like it, because A, he was so much older than her, and B, he wasn't Christian. Um, but Nora would take a train all the way down to our English station, and they would see each other there. Nora decided to immigrate to America so that she could be with Richard, but she also did not want to go because then she would have to leave her hometown and family. And she would be all alone because Richard had to stay because of the war. She was very scared to go, but in the end she ended up going because she wanted to be with Richard more. Nora wrote a British ship called the U.S. Mauritania to America. She was four months pregnant with my great uncle Michael. She lived with Richard's two sisters, and she wasn't happy there. She also found that things like how high schoolers wore makeup and dated people was very strange. She didn't let her daughter wear makeup until her senior year in high school. Um, then a few months after she got to America, she got a job as a kindergarten teacher because she um, she always taught younger kids because she never got an education herself in St. Helens because they didn't have enough money to pay for good education. Nora really brought the kind of food that she ate in St. Helens to America. Um, and like she would get British candies all the time and share them with my grandmother. And she um, impacted my grandmother and mother and they would tell stories about her to me. And um, she died in 2016 and she was 90. Uh, my grandmother, Mary Oates and Lyme Mayo, was born in Zaga, the capital of Croatia, in 1941. Her parents had both wars, and they didn't want to work under the new government to be installed, so they were coming to government. So in 1945, her parents left to go to Italy. In 1948, Tamara and her two older brothers, John and Gore, took another train to Naples, Italy, where they stayed at a refugee camp and met up with their parents and went to an Italian school. In 1951, it was a two-week boat trip to New York, but not Ellis Island, because it was close to the The tickets to Buenos Aires, Argentina had been stolen, and Australia was left them to try to turn on that boat. One of the challenges of arriving in America was only 50 American dollars, and having to get sponsored to be financially upheld in New York. The Catholic Church wouldn't sponsor them because her mom was Orthodox, and the Orthodox Church wouldn't sponsor them because her dad was not Catholic. In the end, they ended up getting sponsored by the Methodist Church. When her parents found work in the factory, they moved to Elizabeth, New Jersey, where in 1952 they got their first home. Another challenge of coming to America was learning English. The week after arriving, Tamara had to take an IQ test to know it was the two words, yes and no. In 1960, when she was 18, she got her American citizenship because she wanted to follow the footsteps of the two older brothers who had gotten married in Italy. The tradition that she thought was weird and new was Thanksgiving. She had never experienced anything like that before. Tamara is glad she agreed and would like to hear the rest of the
one time my team went here with her friends for out to buy lunch. They were asked if they would like their summer celebrate or go somewhere. They were all still learning with us and none of them understood. So one of them was looking to like, yes. They were shared by a person who was waiting in line to complete what the man had. In addition to his word and his hand, they also like a crowd of other One time, the easy one to work was very Eventually, she took her job because she found an uncle. She got married and had a son to my dad. She recently moved to a retirement to Washington State. There she still has to go to. Okay, so this is my grandfather, the mom and my son. He was born and raised in Istanbul, Turkey, which is a really beautiful place. I feel like there are a lot of stereotypes and expectations about what people think Turkey might look like. Some of which I believe, but after researching the country, I got to see what a beautiful place it really is. Especially Istanbul, because of all its beautiful tourist attractions, such as the Grand Bazaar and many universities that are in the All these beautiful things about Turkey, but Milan was a lonely Turkish mom. Although, you might be wondering why that is, because he was born and raised in Turkey, and his mom was raised in Turkey. But that's because of the Armenian genocide in 1915. Although it's not talked about as, as, much as, it, as much as it should be, it was a systematic killing and deportation of Yeva, which was the bond's grandmother, escaped from the border with her infant daughter, Lucy, not me, my great grandmother, after her father, husband, and brother were killed. So she raised Lucy on her own in Turkey, and then um, she raised Lucy on her own in Turkey until she was enough to marry, and she married an Armenian man who lived in Turkey, and they had Levon. And a few years later, they had his brother, Elkhor, and so they were both boy and Throughout elementary, middle, and high school, Levon was a student who put in minimal effort. He wasn't at the top of his class, but he wasn't at the bottom of his class either. He had a lot of natural intelligence, but he didn't take advantage of it. All that changed when he attended college at Robert University in Istanbul. Uh, he was at the top of his class, and because of that, he presented a strongly suggested to go to graduate school in Paris. They helped him apply to about a dozen schools, and he got a full scholarship to Duke University. And so he immigrated to the United States in 1969 on a student visa, Duke University. A really cute story about him going away is that when he was boarding the train to England, which was his first stop, his whole town and all his neighbors put together like a gift basket that was full of food and drinks and candy and stuff so he could take it on the train and share it with the other people that were going on the train and all the other town students. Um, so, and then one of the first people he met when he got to America was my grandmother Catherine because she was working as a secretary at the foreign students office at Duke University. And one of the biggest challenges about coming to America was that his father died after his first year living in North Carolina. It was really hard not being able to be with his family during that time of loss, but he overcame it by giving Turkey as much as he could. Uh, as much as he could. Turkey, slowly but surely, Turkey became so seasoned and not a place he called them. That's because he was finding a new home and forming new relationships in America. When when he arrived in 1969, he was many who died of citizenship in that kingdom. Um, my family friend said Chilhart grew up in South Korea in years old. Korea is a beautiful country. It has lots of mountains and rivers and cities. So the tallest mountain there is Mount Halsong, which is about 6,400 feet. The reason why Korea split half is from the Korean War, which was from 1950 to 1950. Sam grew up playing in the Han River, which is near his house, and ice skating in a pond next to his house. He grew up only eating like fresh and non-processed food, like if he wanted to get a peach, he would walk down to the peach orchard and cook one, or if he wanted chickens, he would buy like a live chicken. So that was very different when he moved to America. In 1971, his family, which was his mom, his dad, his older sister, his younger brother, and him, uh, left Korea and went on their way to America. So they had a stopover in Disneyland, and in Hawaii, which came from his home here, uh, here, and you can see that, that the Hawaii airport was blazing on Okay. After that, they arrived in Flushing and Queens North. At the time, Flushing did not have like a large um, Korean community, so they felt a bit like out of place. Uh, yeah. Um, but he remembers his first taste of peace and some nuts, which is buried in his little kitty and he really like it. Really 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 the biggest struggle was that he knew no English and he went to a school that only spoke English. So the teacher would be like talking and like 
writing things on the board, he would just write down in his notebook whatever the teacher wrote down the capital of the class. Even though he didn't know any English, he still played baseball with his friends and had a good time. He grew up in New York City for the rest of his high school years, and, and slowly America's seen his home. He now works at the Smithsonian and works on NASA projects, and has two daughters who live in the Bronx Valley, Massachusetts. Meanwhile, my grandmother was born in Shaman City, in Southern China, from West Chicago. At an early age, she moved to Taiwan. Taiwan is an island nation formed after the end of the Chinese Civil War. In Taiwan, she lived in Taipei, a small Japanese town. She had a really big family, so she was very, very proud of her house. She was living in Taiwan, as it was. Plus, Taiwan was surprisingly good at living when it comes to international. And on Chinese New Year, They were going to the university together and they were in German. The only class they had together was in German. 
class. But my grandmother had a broken leg, so my bubble carried her book bag for her. Um, did you know that Greece ha has the third largest coastline in Europe and the 11th largest in the world? There are 6,000 islands in Greece, but only 227 are inhabited. Greece is well known for its fresh seafood and local meat, and you may or may not know some of its famous desserts, such as bukumades, which are basically fried dough covered in honey, baklava, which is probably the most common, it's very nutty, and garakta buriko, which is a Greek version of custard pie. Um, one important date to know in Greek culture is Greek Independence Day, which is March 25th, commemorating the day they got their freedom from the Ottoman Empire. Greek, um, Boston holds the Greek Independence Day break in which many Greek people from all over Massachusetts come to. Um, a family memory that my grandfather says stayed with him is when his grandfather had to go to Cyprus to possibly fight the war. Turkey had just invaded Cyprus and all of many men in Greece were sent to go to Cyprus to fight. He returned within a week because he was older than all the other men. He was 26 or 27 and the whole family was extremely worried. Luckily he didn't have to fight but it still was a worry. Um, my grandfather worked in a pizza shop in college but went on to work as a social worker in Salem Hospital. After his diagnosis in the USA, my couple became a Greek Orthodox priest and still has his own parish in, in Tinsboro, Massachusetts. Personally, I'm from Greek and have been surrounded in its culture since I was little. When my mom was pregnant with me, she took me to Greek festivals and apparently I used to kick in her stomach whenever I heard a Greek song. And yeah, thank you for asking. So, um, Krishnandu Dabu Zungar was born in 1976 in Kolkata, India. His nickname since birth has been Simba. Um, although he was born in Kolkata, and his and both his parents were Indian, he never actually lived in India. Um, before he immigrated, he lived in Gabon, Kenya, and Zaire, all in Africa. Um, after he immigrated, he went to New York for a short time when he was six years old in 1982. He doesn't remember much of New York for the first time, but so the real memory of being in the U.S. started in California in 1983, so less than, less than a year later. Um, and then two years after that, he moved to Saudi Arabia with his family. Um, and then he came back to America to go to, to, go to North, to go to Phil's Exeter Academy in Exeter, New Hampshire. And then he moved back to New York where he turned with us. Um, the, he and his family came here on, on his dad's job opportunity and they all had work visas. Um, for Citibank, and they kept that with for two years. Um, and they dealt with a lot of stereotypes, such as educated Indians, born Indians. Um, it originally was supposed to be a, a part-time opportunity, um, but they stayed because it was a really good job, it paid well, they had a good community there, and uh, both he and his brother had pretty much grown up in India. So, that's okay, you don't get that. Um, but both there you go. Oh, <laughs> um, but both he and his brother had grown up in India, so they were like, um, and I've already just said, but he didn't have a typical green card situation. Um, so he said, he told me that in the 80s, if you were an educator, it was really easy to get a green card. He ended up getting a green card in six months. Um, and his affluence and education in his family shielded him from a lot of
he loved Argentina, he loved lear learning about the history, and he also loved soccer, which was a big thing in Argentina. And a cool story about soccer was he would play best at the end of the soccer games because he had so much stamina that all the other players were tired, but he wasn't. Uh, he also loved ping pong. <laughs> and that's a Korean thing, but they had a, you know, it's Korean, they had a championship in, in this school in Argentina. And another cool story is that uh, in the championship, he played all with his left hand until the final match when he totally destroyed the last guy with his right. Um, and his family moved to New York City in 1983 because he was 17 because, again, education, but there were more job um, opportunities too. And uh, some got a degree in finance. Um, unfortunately, his sister couldn't come with them because she already had a job and everything in, Ar in Argentina, so she didn't move with them, but that, that was okay. <laughs> um, he met his future wife, Andrea Skeen, in Vermont, and they had a son named Rourke, and she did Newburyport, which is where I live. Um, and yeah, they lived happily ever after, they're still alive. Um, this is me with Chris. Um, and he would pack sweet because he's such a great friend to have. He's really awesome. That's, that's it. In 1965, my uncle Mark Wright was born in Victoria, which is one of the three capitals of South Africa. He was the eldest of four. His brother is Jason Ron, and his sister Tina. Um, he was closest to coming out because of their age difference. They were only 18 months apart, but he was years and years older than his brothers. They all grew up in the suburbs, going to school, playing sports like um, soccer and cricket. And they also grew up in apartheid. Wow, well, but since they were white, um, they had um, more opportunities and just like a, a lot of an easier time. Um, but he didn't know that so many people were struggling around him and he was very aware of that. A little bit about apartheid is that was a policy set in 1948, which segregated South Africa for many, many years. That's just a sort of short story of it. Um, it ended in 1994 when Nelson Mandela was elected president after being in jail for protests. Um, and stopped apartheid, but the country still feels the negative effects and long-term effects that um, policy brought. A little bit about South Africa is that it was it's two thirds plateau and the animal profile is very large. Um, there are animals from lions to birds with a lot of prey and prey. Back to my uncle. Uh, he immigrated in 1964 from South Africa to Boca Florida, where he attended the College of Boca to study business. He came on a student visa um, and a scholarship for soccer, along with four other South Africans who came on a scholarship for soccer. He didn't know two of them, but got to know them very quickly. Um, he met his future wife, my aunt Lila. They moved to Newburyport, Massachusetts, and got pregnant with their first son, Darren. Um, the biggest adjustment for him once he moved to uh, Newburyport was the weather, because everyone knows that New England weather is terrible. In the winter, it gets so cold, where in South Africa, the lowest it gets is usually like around 45 Fahrenheit. Um, after settling down in Newburyport, he was asked to try out for the Tampa Bay Rowdy, which was the professional soccer team at the time. So we went back to Florida, and once he made the team, he obviously joined the team, and they ended up in Nationals, and he's still friends with his teammate because he said that he looks back on it, and it's such an amazing experience, and those are friends for life. Um, while he was on the team, the owner of the team sent him up with a bank job, and he's been in banking ever since. After he got injured playing a game of Sunday soccer, uh, they settled on Plum Island, Massachusetts, with three kids, their son, Darren, um, Johnny, and his, uh, their uh, daughter, Lizzie. Um, the effects he's had on her family is just that he's so fun to talk to. He's fun to have dinner with, he's fun to watch sports with. Um, he's, he's so kind and I'm so grateful to have him. But um, I'm also grateful to learn from him because there are two phrases that I learned. There are a few more, but these are like the ones that are like have the most importance to me. Um, where, please pardon my pronunciation, Goji uh, Moore, uh, which means good morning, and Eke Jolie, which means I love you. Um, I'm also grateful to just be around him and to learn from his family when they come to visit for like holidays. And
and also how easy it is for, to use for school projects. <laughs> okay, so I'm doing my aunt Louis Arabello and she immigrated from Colombia. Colombia is located in South America and it's a very beautiful and very diverse country. It's 439,736 square miles and the capital is Bogota, I don't know how to say it. Um, Luz lived there and grew up there until she was 15. And the population of Colombia is 50.34 million and the population of Bogota is 7.81 million. Luz lived in a small house with a very big yard. She was very close with her sister Vicky because all the kids had to share a bed and she shared one with Vicky. They always played this game called Soldier where there are two teams and you'd have to run to capture like an object and then the other team would capture you and your team captured for you. She taught me and my cousins how to play and it's very fun. Her mom was a very good cook and would always watch cooking shows and would get very mad when chefs would waste food because they were not very wealthy and food cost a lot of money. Her dad immigrated two years before them and would always send them dresses and dolls and she would always get so excited. She immigrated when she was 15 years old with three of her siblings and her mother. So first they flew to Mexico and then they illegally crossed the border to Texas and then they drove in the back of the truck to New York City, which is actually like down there. But um, and. They got an apartment in Queens, and the main immigrant group there was Greek, so it was pretty easy fitting in. Her first job was at a coffee shop, and she would bike there every day because the bus was too expensive. She served coffee and warm, fresh pastries. She went to the New York City College and majored in languages and psychology, but she was best at Italian and French. During college, she worked for an immigration lawyer. He was a harsh but a good lawyer, and she learned all of his ways. She heard about law schools in Boston, and with financial aid, she was able to go. It was her first time living alone, coming from a big family, and she liked the solitude. She met my uncle, Ed, there, and they had my three cousins, and that's the story of how we got from Colombia to America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
but she has new family here. She, she, she has a new husband and a daughter named Alaska, and she, and she is my age. She has no regrets about living in the U.S.
1992, Alma moved to Israel because she thought that she would be much safer there. She got a job as a maid, and she went from being a maid, from having maids to actually being one herself. They were very poor and lonely because she had no other family besides her husband and her two kids. So in 1997, Alma's sister Vita bought Alma's family plane tickets to go to Boston and go to Logan Airport. Alla had lots of family in the U.S., including her sister, Rita. When she got there, her husband found a job as a computer technician, and Alla worked as an accountant at Harvard Business School. They got an apartment in Swampscott and learned English and ESL program at North Shore Community College. Alla's family got citizenship in 2002. Alla went for an associate's degree at Marionport College so she could work full-time at her job. Alla continues to read Russian books, eat Russian fish head suits, and celebrate Russian holidays, including Victory Day, which was when the Nazis surrendered. Alla enjoyed the opportunities America has given her family, including her daughter being able to get an education. Thank you. Okay. Um, my father, unfortunately, my father was this French woman in my heart. He um, loved to eat good man. He would always find me doing something more or less. In ancestry, it breeds fighters and um, engineers and doctors, and being more important, they can get a good job and a better education. His dad was a chief engineer on a famous training ship, and he wanted to be inspired to be like him, and he always wanted to be an engineer. He emigrated to America in 1944. He was 21 years old. He came for better jobs, job options, and a better life for his parents. He came as a student and he arrived in 1994. Kent State University in Pennsylvania. He also got offers from Boston University, Boston College, and the um, University of California. He got a scholarship and he worked in the art. He got a double master's in software engineering and mechanical engineering. Um, he got a job in a flight for a visa. Um, this was a hard part because you have to prove that to the company that you were worth taking and you were worth your time. Um, the visa provided some more stability and freedom. He went to Italy um, and Venice uh, just to put the visa. Travel. Um, it was hard to keep the piece set up. There were so many restrictions in terms of flight and uh, travel. So he applied for a green card. He got rejected twice due to uh, bad paperwork. Um, he could be terminated at any moment. He could be sent back to India or he could just get his visa taken away. Um, he finally got a competent lawyer and he got his green card. He was a lot more free, but green cards still mark him as a legitimate student. It makes him a permanent resident as a he wanted a higher status, more stability and rights such as voting and better social security. So he decided to go for his citizenship, but he had to go his Indian citizenship. But he still pushed through. He was never, he was never to return to his homeland um, to live there again. His efforts to pass on the culture and tradition made a lasting effect. Um, he's still alive today. <laughs> Sligo, Ireland, which is a rural part of Ireland, and the closest city was 10 miles away. Through grade and middle school, she had to walk four miles to get there and to go back. Um, and then in high school, she was bullied for being a country girl because high school was 10 miles away and they didn't have a car. So after high school, she got her first job at age 19 as a receptionist. She hated it. She didn't like the typing. And so she quit this job as a receptionist. And she decided she really liked animals, so she wanted to work at a vet clinic. So she got a job at a vet clinic, and then she found out she was getting very depressed when the animals died. So she quit that job. And then she went to Manchester, England, and stayed there for three years, tried many other different jobs, didn't work out, and then she moved back to Sligo, got a job at the vet clinic again. And in September 1995, her bestie moved to Boston. <laughs> <laughs> moved to Boston, which kickstarted her idea of moving to America. And then in April of 1995, her and her family decided 
hey, Siobhan should move to, to Manchester with her sister. So she did that, and she moved in May of 1995 at the age of 29 years old. And she stayed in an apartment in Manchester with her sister, and she, she went there because she thought it would be easier to get a job working with animals. But it wasn't. <laughs> so her first job there, while she was looking for jobs with animals, Bridgetown, Barbados, and she, but she grew up in St. Thomas, Barbados. Her parents are named Tyron and Hortense Lynch. Eleven years after her birth, she got a brother named Tyson Lynch. She was like an aunt or a mom to him when her parents went there. Fun fact, she actually made him take off her shoes when they got back home sometimes. So. 
she already had an associate's degree and one of her masters. So she wanted to come to Bur I mean America. So shortly after that, she was gonna go, but she just turned 21. So the green card pro the green card process had to be restarted. So at that time, she waited until the time came when she went to America in 2000. When she came to America, she stayed with her parents and her mother and someone named Raymond Prescott's mother knew each other from school in Barbados. So Juanita Prescott visited Raymond Prescott's mother and one day Raymond Prescott did the same and visited his mother in New York. And Juanita and Raymond Prescott soon became wed in 2002. Two years after that, Juanita gave birth to Keanu in America. Raymond Prescott was in Barbados still, but Juanita stayed in America to give birth to Keanu. Shortly after Keanu's birth, they came back to Barbados for four years. And then I was born in 2009. Since then, we stayed in America and unless we travel. Juanita's only, only challenge is were that was the racial biasness to her skin tone. And she impacted me because she was there throughout everything in my life, through the goods and the bads. And uh, she's known me before I even know myself. And one funny thing is that my mom and my dad both changed the story on who fell in love with one first. My dad says when she saw me, she fell in love Love with me, but my mom says no, it's the other way around. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Born in 1970 in Palermo, Sicily, which is an island off of southern Sicily. He had a relatively happy childhood in a big family, and his parents had many siblings. He had many friends who he hung out with during the summer, but there were downsides. Sicily has had a long problem with the mafia, and as a result, there was a lot of stress and a bad economy. Um, Francesco's opinion, in Francesco's opinion, that there was a very bad school system. Before high school, you had to choose a career because every single high school was dedicated to one subject. His dad wanted him to go into tourism, so he did what his dad wanted to. But sadly, his dad then died from uh, a liver disease, which left a burden on Francesco. So he left school to try to support his family, and despite high unemployment rates, he got lucky and found a job, which he stayed there for 10 years. He then decided to immigrate for a better education and to get a master's degree. So in 1999, when he was 29 years old, he immigrated. When he arrived, he waited five years for citizenship because he came as a student. And he learned a lot of English from TV. And when he read, he always had a dictionary next to him to look up words he did not understand. At first, he had no work permit, but later he got his job as a wine, his first job as a wine, as an inventory manager at a wine distributor. He had called the company and they told him to send the resume, but he decided to give it in person for better impressions. And it worked. He got the job. In his family, he was the first to leave Sicily in centuries. And to our family, he's introduced less ingredients in food always fresh, never frozen, olive oil instead of butter, and my brother and I are both dual-lingual. It gives us a step in another culture, and Francesco does not regret his immigration, and it has impacted our family a lot. I was born in Enfield, just outside of London in 1975, to parents Mags and Graham. During her childhood, her mom worked in London, giving her a daily second-hand account of the civil unrest caused by troubles. The Troubles, of course, were a period of great civil unrest in England, Northern Ireland, and just basically the entire British Isles caused by the Irish Republican Army and guerrilla warfare between them and the Unionists in Northern Ireland and the UK. Uh, she attended a Church of England school along with the majority of her neighborhood. While in school, she joined the choir, touring the country on the weekends to sing church hymns. In 19... 94, she graduated with top marks in her A-levels and decided to attend university in Wales, uh, when she, uh, where she first studied English literature, then for her master's journalism. A 
Upon graduating, Liz took a job at the BBC, becoming a junior Welsh correspondent for three years. Her plan was to continue working at the BBC indefinitely, but this was turned on its head when during an exchange to America, she met David. She and her friends were staying at a youth hostel in Washington, D.C., and not knowing the area, asked David for direction to the train station. There they soon found that they were on the same train, and Liz and David actually had seats right next to each other. So during the train ride, they fell in love, and soon moved to England and got married in 1999. Uh, then they moved to Swampscott, and she immigrated in 2000 to Swampscott, Massachusetts. Liz took a job at WGBH no less than a month later, something she considers the single most contributing factor to her quick assimilation into American culture. This, on top of her American family, being of course her in-laws, um, made it entirely easy for her after three, um, yeah. After three years, she left her job at WGBH and moved to Marblehead, um, owing to the birth of Abigail and Benjamin, her children, of course. Um, two years after, she took a producer position at WGBH, The World. A year later, she became an American citizen. Despite her children being very Americanized, as she put it, they still celebrate traditions from England, including making mince pies, having multiple stockings, singing hymns as a family, and as Liz put it, just doing everything very extra around Christmas. To this day, Liz and her family live in Marblehead, and during this, they have a quiet and very peaceful life. I was born and raised in Meshka. She has a younger sister who lives in Germany. Neither she nor his mother emigrated with them. His father emigrated back to Portugal, um, but he does miss them all. He, although he has not been able to visit for seven to eight years, he is still in contact with all of them. When most neighbors in Germany hated children, causing them to clash more than once, as Manuel has three sons, who he loves very much. He emigrated from Meshida, the town where he grew up. Meshida is in the state of North Rhine-Westphalia, which is right there. He now lives in Chester Springs. For the first six weeks he lived here, he lived in an apartment with his family. After that, he found his current home, right there. He's not an American citizen and doesn't plan to become one, as, as, as he, he does not agree with, nor, nor does he like the policy that even if he lived in Europe or Asia, um, if he lived, even if he lived somewhere else other than America, he would still be taxed by the American government. He doesn't agree with that, so isn't an American citizen. Thank you. My family friend, Nardia Pret emigrated from Jamaica on May 11, 2011. Um, the reason she immigrated was because of her children's education. You see, Jamaica is the second poorest island in the Caribbean, um, in, out of 7,000 other islands in the Caribbean. And so she didn't have enough money to send her children to a, uh, to a private school to get a better education. She owned her own company and line of businesses of, of convenience stores and convenience and liquor stores but she wasn't making enough money from them. So she decided to move to America where she could get a better job to support her family. Um, once she moved to America, there were, a lot of uh, there were a lot of changes. One of the main changes was the, th the temperature and climate. It was very dif difficult for her to, tr to move here because A, she was leaving half of her family behind and B, well, again, the temperature and climate. The average temperature in Jamaica is 87 degrees throughout the entire year, and the average temperature in America is only 67, and she had never worn a pair of pants or a long sleeve shirt or a jacket before she had come to America. And now, with her new job, she's not even allowed to wear shorts and t-shirts, even in the summer. Um, another big difference was the food. She couldn't, whenever she tried to go to our local supermarket, and find the ingredients and things that she needed to make the normal traditional dishes that she would make in Jamaica. She couldn't find any of them because, well, she's now in America. I have personal experience with this.
trying to make the dish that I brought today, it was very difficult to find all the ingredients you needed. I had to go to seven different stores. And, well, now she's here with her family, and she's able to support her children. They have a much better education, and she has a good job to help, to help her family. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so hi. I have chosen my great aunt, Muhayo. She immigrated in 2012. She came from Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Her current location is Washington, D.C. She is not uh, considered a normal immigrant because she married my great uncle, Kirk, uh, in the U.S., and he is a um, lawyer. And she was recommended to get a U.S. Citizen citizenship, which she did, but she did not want it. She was hoping she could keep her Russian citizenship. She also did not want to come to the to the U.S. Muhayla loved it in Bishkek, and she hoped she would live there forever. I have never been to Bishkek, and I never and I never knew much about it. But after what Muhayla had told me about it, what Muhayla told me, I hope I am able to go one day. Nor did I know much about Muhayla's immigration adventure, and I was really fascinated in what she. Uh, had to go through in order to get to the U.S. A cool fact that I knew, but she told me more about it, uh, Muhayla did not know how to drive to just three years ago. I don't know why, but I think it's because where she lived in Bishkek was, uh, must have been really busy and she could go by taxi. Thank you for that. So, so my mom, Hank Trung, was born in 1984 and taught in Hue in Central Vietnam um, for here. Um, she grew up very poor and she lived in a tin house by like a river. Uh, so she went to school to the age of 15 um, and had to drop out to support her family. But in her early 20s, she moved down south to Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and there she became a real estate agent and was also owned at Nail Salon. And that is where she also met my dad. And they went on a first date to go to a zoo, right there. Um, they, years later, they got married and had me and my younger brother. Um, in 2015, my mom decided to immigrate to the US, but my dad had already been in Boston. So we flew from Ho Chi Minh City to San Francisco, California. Then my dad was in Boston, so we had to fly down to uh, Massachusetts. And we arrived on August 15, 2015, and my dad picked us up at 9.30 at p.m. Um, and drove us home to Medford, Massachusetts, where we made, uh, settled. Uh, we, she mainly left because she wanted more opportunities for her and her kids, and there were better schools here. Her biggest challenge was learning English, um, but she now goes to school that, goes to school where she can learn English and she's still trying to get her driver's license. Um, she now lives in Malden in an Asian community where she still can have her favorite dish like pho and kamsa. But she uses the train to transport and that is the story of how my mom came to America. Delma Lorente was born in 1977 in Amulang, Philippines. She was born into a Catholic home and had five sisters and four brothers. In her free time, she mostly farmed for rice, mainly to sell at the market to make more income for her family. And she also went to school, where she learned how to speak fluent English. And she did not like this because they, it was very strict and they even had to wear uniforms. At home, she spoke the native dialect of their town, but she also spoke Tagalog, which is the national language of the Philippines. Some common sayings in Tagalog are palam, which is goodbye, or kamusta, which is hello. Then she moved to the United Arab Emirates in her late teens, exactly 19 years old. Here she met Samer, her future husband, and she worked at a school teaching younger kids, which she wanted to do and enjoyed. She would weekly send home money to her family back home to support them. In fact, 21% of people in Dubai are Filipino, so it's very common for people such as her to go to the Philippines to make more income because there's successful jobs and you make good money there. The United Arab Emirates is very developed with temples and skyscrapers of all shapes and sizes. And um, 
One big attraction is the Burja Plate, which is over a half a mile tall, and it is one of the largest skyscrapers in the world. Then she moved to the United States of America in 2015. They first moved to Revere, Massachusetts to live with Sommer, Sommer's relatives. It was hard on Delma because there was different religious beliefs because she grew up in a Catholic home and they believed in Islam and um, practiced that. And another problem was that she didn't know Sudanese, which is what they mainly spoke. So there was a lot of language barrier there. They then moved to Gloucester, Massachusetts to live with us. And they lived with us for a couple of months and Adam, their son, went to the elementary school up the street. They are finally settled in Beverly, Massachusetts, and Sommer and Delma both have working and paying jobs. They are still sad and miss home a lot, and Delma especially misses the heat, which has been very tough for her in the cold winter here. We are always amazed at their dedication to their culture and their religion. Thank you. My cousin-in-law, Claire Debye, was born in 1999 in France, France, and there she lived until she went to college. Immigrating to America was not the first time Claire had immigrated. She immigrated to the Netherlands to study. At college, she met my cousin, Ben Strombach, who was at the time her future husband and is now her husband. Because of the immigration process, Claire could not go back to France to see her family, and they weren't allowed to be here to attend her wedding. They had to watch a recorded video of it instead. This has, been the, this has been the most challenging thing for Claire. She decided to immigrate to the U.S. for one to be with um, Ben and for another because there are more jobs here for someone who has a bachelor's degree but not a master's degree. Claire does not have a master's degree and in Europe most jobs you need to have a master's degree for. Claire now lives in Fairfield, Connecticut. She is 22 years old and perfectly healthy, no horrific death yet. 